And there we go. We're going live over on YouTube. And good afternoon to you. How is everybody doing today? I am absolutely wonderful. Thanks, everybody, for stopping by today. It's good to see you all. I hope you're well. Something I just want to get out in front of and state right now, um, where I am in Florida, uh, I am in no danger uh, regarding Hurricane Elsa. So it's basically it's going to be a bunch of wind and a bunch of rain, which, I mean, ultimately, that's what a hurricane is. But... Um, yeah, no, he was talking about like 30, 35 mile an hour gust, maybe where I am. I am in the middle of the state, um, which is not to say, I mean, you know, Florida is basically a marsh flat <laughs> until you get up to uh, to uh, southern Georgia. But um, no, everything's hunky-dory here, and there's no danger from the storm to us, so... Uh, for those of you who have reached out to me, thank you. Everything is just fine. Um, I am not even a little bit concerned about it. Hello, Katie. Hello, just a passerby. Good to see you guys today. Um, I'm just kind of arranging my windows here. I have this tiny little monitor. Look, I don't want to rattle the tin cup, okay, guys? But seriously, if somebody was going to donate to me here on the channel, I, 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 like a bigger monitor, or even just a second same size smaller monitor would be appreciated so much. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Moving windows around is about like 10% of the time on my videos. Disney's weather mech strikes again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, during the 2004 hurricane season, though, uh, we were in Tampa, and it's, there's a long story about the hilariousness of that, because the last hurricane basically came into the Gulf and hit Tampa. We went to Tampa to get away from it, and it hit Tampa and went straight up the I-4 corridor. And when we were driving through, um, we actually did see, like, uh, the, you know, those fresh saplings that Disney rotates through. Uh, on its driveways and stuff um, because for some reason we drove in or near Disney property coming back from Tampa that weekend and yeah we saw a lot of those pushed over we saw some signage that was bent uh, that sort of thing but no we're we're gonna be fine we're gonna be fine anyway so me bitching about the weather and bitching about my monitor aside uh, let's go ahead and catch up on last night's AD&D game, because that was a lot of fun. Uh, had a bigger group this time. A uh, few players still out on vacay and whatnot. Um, hello, Samuelloy. Good to see you. Party finished up their shopping spree in Greyhawk, and they took their newfound bestie back to the Greyhawk dungeon, um, they have, like, just given her a lot of their spare arms and armor, so she has quite the formidable armor class now, <laughs> as if she didn't before. <clears throat> um, made it back to the castle without any random encounters, despite my best attempts. Uh, once again, at the behest of the leader of the men-at-arms, the bard used the lyre of building to create a longhouse. Now, I need to, uh, I need, I need to look at construction rates. Does that think I'm being a little bit generous with a lyre of building? Uh, if you're not familiar, in AD&D, a lyre of building is a magic item that can, over the course of three turns, that's 30 minutes, replicate the work of a hundred men laboring for three days. Um, now, I'm sure we have all seen or heard about uh, uh, Mennonites and, and Amish doing barn raisings like in a day. 
you know, literally just they they get together, it's a big party, and they work all day and sometimes into the night by lantern light. And they'll get like a massive barn belt. So I figured a stable was within the realms of 100 men laboring for three days straight. Um, but the the leader of the men-at-arms, Braun, is kind of playing uh, uh, playing the long game with their encampment near Castle Greyhawk, and this time requested a longhouse. And if you're not familiar with what a longhouse is, it is basically, if you picture it's like a wedding hall, like a one-story wedding hall kind of affair. You know, it's maybe 40 feet wide, 100 feet long. Um, there might be a hearth in the middle or at the far end of it, but uh, in the Middle Ages, just across Northern Europe, uh, different tribes and societies would use them. Uh, they were gathering places, eating places, resting places, uh, you know, if there's enough room, sometimes folk would sleep in them. Uh, so the men at arms wanted one. So they used the liar of building again to, uh, to create a longhouse, just a, a short walk away from the stables. And they have Dairn's Entrance Fortress. They're slowly building a village near Castle Greyhawk. And I think that's hilarious. And that gives me, as a dungeon master, a lot of fuel to work with. Now, as far as adventuring in the dungeon, they um, they took the elevator back down to the second level. And this time they explored to the west where they found a mirror maze. Now, they had actually been through that before, but it was sometime early last year. Uh, possibly the year before. I don't recall exactly. My, um, my dungeon master's notes became so bloated I had to save that, put it aside, and open a new document. The thing is like, three or four megs and yeah word tends to create kind of bloated documents and it is full of some screen grabs and whatnot but still that's a kind of a large text document so i started a new one so i'm not a hundred percent sure so they went back into the into the uh, mirror maze and in an obscure corner they encountered a layer of doppelgangers of 11 doppelgangers and fought them, and man, I always thought doppelgangers were kind of scary. Maybe they are to a peer-level party, but like I threw eleven shadows at them as a random encounter in the uh, in in the previous week's adventure when there were lots of people at the table, and that was, you know. That was kind of touch and go. They actually got some hits in. The doppelgangers did not. The, doppel <laughs> the doppelgangers got no hits in. Um, the uh, Wand of Frost was once again brought into play, which softened them up, and the party then uh, proceeded to murder all of them. Um... They smashed a couple of mirrors, because this happened in a cul-de-sac. They were like, well, where'd they come from? So they smashed a couple of mirrors, and find, lo and behold, there was a space where the 11 doppelgangers were hanging out. And, oh my god, the loot that the party got. Um, literal tons of coins. Silver, electrum, and gold. Uh, jewelry. One gemstone. I was kind of shocked. It was one gemstone worth 75 gold pieces. A little tourmaline, I think. And then uh, they got um, some as-yet-unidentified magic items. Uh, scroll, ring, um, and, and some other things. And I don't want to say the names because my players might be watching or listening. And I don't want to give it away yet. You have to identify them. Um... So there's, uh, 
yeah, there, there, there's a not inconsiderable amount of loot that they now have to haul out of the dungeon in Castle Greyhawk. Uh, the doppelgangers were worth a whole lot of experience points. I mean, just them by themselves. And then the treasure itself was worth a whole lot of experience points. And it was just like 27,000 silver pieces. Which sounds like a lot, and we're going to get to this in learning about Dungeons & Dragons uh, more, learning how to play, but silver is 20 to 1. Uh, so it's 20 silver to 1 gold, so it's not that much gold. But then Electrum, there were like 9,000 Electrum pieces, and then 16,000 gold pieces. This was quite a few doppelgangers and quite a large amount of treasure so the party has now got to figure out what to do or how, how to get see 16,000 and 9,000 that's 25,000 and then 27,000 and divide that by 10 yeah so uh, 5,200 pounds of coins they have to haul out um, and even though they're a party of 11, at most, that's maybe 90 pounds or 900 coins each that they can carry out. So I can tell by my YouTube metrics that I'm boring the hell out of you guys. So let's move on to AD&D lessons. Oh, that's where... Sorry. That's where we concluded the, the night session. Partially because it was coming up on 1 o'clock... And also because my internet service provider decided to do some remote maintenance at uh, 12.30, which I had to scramble and get Discord installed on my phone so I could finish my game. But by the time I got it installed and set up, there were only like 10 minutes left, and I just kind of cataloged some of the loot that they had found. So, let us move on. So, yesterday... Yesterday's lesson, yes, my light went out, that's why I'm shadowed over here and not over there. Yesterday's lesson, we learned the basics of creating a character in Dungeons & Dragons. And if you break out your copy of the player's handbook, which is over here, you can, you can follow along on screen if you don't have a copy, um, we created a fighter. And just to, to reiterate his stats, uh, 18 by 65 strength, very nice. Intelligence of 12, which gives us three additional languages. And we're going to talk a bit about languages today. Wisdom of 13, Dexterity of 11, Constitution of 13, Charisma of 14. Now, why didn't I just stick the, the 14 in... Uh, say, Constitution and the Charisma, uh, make that 13, or even just dump the 11 in Charisma. And I touched on this yesterday. The loyalty of henchmen and hirelings is a very important thing in AD&D. You want to be able to have expert hirelings and henchmen who will follow your commands, who will go into a dungeon who will drag your unconscious ass out. And ensuring that only comes with a good command of presence and high charisma. So that's why I chose to put the 14 in charisma, not in dexterity. It gains me nothing in dexterity. It gains me little bit more uh, survivability for resurrection and raised dead in Constitution. But it gains me nothing in wisdom. For fighter, all it gains me in intelligence is extra languages. So, 14 in charisma to have a good command presence amongst any hirelings that he would have. So, let's talk a little bit about intelligence and languages. Now, Everyone speaks the common tongue. It's the common tongue. <laughs> it's, um, 
virtually every intelligent being that can has the equipment, you know, tongue, lips, teeth, soft palate, and so on in the shape of a human mouth and vocal cords can communicate through spoken language. And common is the broadest language, you know, whether in your mind's eye you think of it as, as Latin or some fantasy alphabet, some gift from the gods, everyone speaks common. Everyone gets that language. Now, in the case, <clears throat> excuse me, in the case of demi-humans, as we're going to see, because the main focus of today's lesson is actually going to be on races, but in the case of demi-humans, um, being raised in societies that interact with other demi-human races and humans, and maybe more of an emphasis on book learning, um, there's a myriad of languages available to demi-humans. Elves, for example, get off the shelf, like, I think six additional languages they speak, um, or six languages total, maybe. We'll have to look when we get, when we get to races, but they speak common, uh, elven, obviously, uh, halfling, uh, goblin, orc, um, it just goes on and on. So an elf with a high intelligence <clears throat> can potentially speak as many as a dozen languages. <clears throat> and being able to speak languages, I mean, it's one thing to have, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> it's one thing to have a high charisma and attempt to communicate to a given being or beings um, that you are not hostile or that you are hostile and they should bend to your will um, to negotiate price of an item or something like that. But if you can't speak their language, it becomes commensurately more difficult. Um, and so what, what that, uh, what that does, what, what having a, a broad spectrum of languages does is it opens up more opportunities for parlay. Uh, and I mean, certainly if someone, a group of elves is going to speak the common tongue, but if a band strictly of humans met them, and it was kind of a potentially chancy encounter, I, as the DM, might look favorably along, uh, upon the human who could speak Elvish to them. So that's just food for thought on languages. And so uh, this particular character has an intelligence of 12, so he can speak three additional languages in addition to common and the alignment tongue. Now, when we did a deep dive on alignments a couple of weeks ago, I talked about the alignment tongue, and I want to I want to reiterate this, and I want to go over alignment languages just a little bit before we dive into races. Um, alignment languages, and we'll just scroll down here. Alignment, that is on page 33. And I think we've had a pretty comprehensive overview of alignments. I don't think we need to dedicate too much. Um, okay, it's not under alignments. But I don't think we need to dedicate too much time to alignments. Um, but I'll mention this again, just to reinforce, because we are talking about languages. Alignment language is not a spoken, written conversational full syntax language it's a series of signs maybe a catchphrase maybe a catechism just just some utter tautology a handshake let me think of a freemason handshake that communicates to another being that you are lawful neutral or that you are chaotic good or that you are uh neutral evil um, 
it's a way of getting the idea of your alignment over to the other creature and that you mean them no harm if indeed that's that's what you mean them um it's not a conversational language and it never takes up a language slot and indeed you can't learn another alignments alignment language <sighs> Um, so you can't say, okay, I have three additional languages. Uh, I'll take common, my alignment language, neutral, lawful good, and chaotic good too. No, you can't. your alignment language is something you keep close. And you don't just go around trying to teach it to people or asking people to teach it to you. It is considered very rude. Uh, Awig says, it sounds like thieves can't for alignment. Yes, but, and I would point this out, thieves can't is a language that only thieves can know. So while it is like that, it, it's its own thing. So, so you're absolutely right, uh, Awig. It, it is like thieves can't but there is also thieves can't in AD&D &D. and it is also something that only thieves know and it like an alignment language it's a freebie so you can be a neutral good thief let's say you're a neutral good human thief so you've got uh, and you've got an intelligence of nine um, your alignment language common and thieves can't and thieves can't is a conversational language you can carry on a long and to any listeners outside either confusing or completely mundane discussion you know um you could be talking about casing a jewelry shop and robbing it and to an outsider it sounds like you're talking about you know going to going out to get a glass of mead you know so just just kind of Keep that in mind too, but that that's a that's a very, very salient point, Awig. So let's talk about races in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Now, one thing that I did want to touch on a little bit here. One thing that I do want to touch on is um you might be thinking to yourself, well, Bill, this is all about how to build a character, but I want to know how to play Dungeons & Dragons. First of all, character creation is a big part of play, but also we will get to best practices soon, very soon. Once we get out of character creation, best practices will, will be our next, uh, uh, our next step. So... Scrolling up, let's see. So if you pop open your book, uh, look on page 13, right-hand column, we have character races. Oh, that's tiny. I need to zoom that in a little bit, my poor old eyes. Now, as it follows, like it says, after a player character has determined the abilities of his or her character, it is then time to decide of what racial stock the character is to be. For purposes of the game, the racial stocks are limited to the following. Dwarven, Elven, Gnome, Half-Elven, Halfling, Half-Orc, and Human. And yes, Gary liked to put everything in alphabetical order, which is fine. Each racial stock has advantages and disadvantages. And I want to stop right there. Because I want to talk to you guys about a table that we're going to get to in just a few minutes. About level limits for demi-humans. It is very sticky for some people. And they, they, they pull their hair and they claim that mean old Gary Gygax doesn't want demi-humans to excel. And maybe that's racism. Um, but go back and read that sentence. Each racial stock has advantages and disadvantages. All right. So let's continue. Although in general, human is superior to the other for reasons you will discover as you read on. And that's where we're talking about the, the level cap being removed. 
The Dungeon Master may have restriction as to which races are allowed in the campaign due to the circumstances of the Melu. Now, if I was running a game, say I was running something based very heavily on Chronicles of Prydain by uh, Alexander Lloyd, um, I, your characters would be human. There's one dwarf in the game who's actually more like a kind of like a mentally slow gnome. Um, but uh, other than that, and evil spirits and, and non-player character creatures, everyone in Chronicles of Perdain is human. And if, you, if I said, okay, I'm setting this game in the Chronicles of Perdain setting, you wouldn't play an elf or a dwarf or a halfling or a half-orc or half-elf. Or no, for that matter. You would play a human. Um, so there's a couple of tables here. Now, now this first table we're just going to gloss over briefly. Uh, or no, I'm sorry. This is not the table I thought it was. This first table we're actually going to focus on strongly. And this is character class limitations. And as we go down, we'll go down and across and look at what each race can do. Uh, dwarves cannot be clerics. They cannot be druids. Um, oh, and if you look, there are some notes, these bold letters. Uh, the A means... Uh, the, the bold next to the character class um, refers to alignment. So you could have a chaotic evil cleric in your party. I pity you if you do, unless everyone else is evil also. Um, and even then, <laughs> it's like asking a chaotic evil cleric for, uh, for a cure light wounds would be a bit like asking Charlie Manson to help you set a broken elbow. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. Um... So a cleric can be of any alignment. Dwarves cannot be clerics. Elves cannot be clerics. Gnomes cannot. Half-elves can. Halflings cannot. Half-orcs can. And humans can. Um, you know, I think the simplest way to do this is to just go across by race and just go across and then down. So dwarves cannot be clerics nor druids. They can be fighters of any alignment. They can be thieves of neutral across the neutral and evil spectrum they can be assassins and assassins can only be evil uh, they cannot be monks <laughs> this idea of a kung fu dwarf is just kind of <laughs> uh, a little hilarious elves um, they cannot be clerics nor druids um, they can be fighters of any alignment they can be magic users of any alignment. They can be thieves, again, in the neutral to evil spectrum, or assassins. They cannot be monks. Gnomes can only be fighters, again, of any alignment, illusionists of any alignment, thieves, neutral to evil, or assassins. And I think you're getting the alignments for the, the classes, so if you have any questions about class alignment, let just, just let me know. Half-elves have a little bit more uh, flexibility. Half-elves can be clerics or druids or fighters. They can be rangers, magic users, thieves, or assassins. Halflings? <laughs> Halflings may be fighters or thieves. Half-orcs? Maybe was where I expect Joshua Ford to, G, to to leap in. Half orcs may be fighters. They may be thieves. They may be clerics, and they may be assassins. Humans can play anything. Now, that might sound just wildly unfair to you. You might think, "Well, that man, what it, Gary? What even, man? Why can't my elf be a paladin? Why can't my dwarf be a monk?" 
specialty classes, generally speaking, are um, are uh, very, very, very powerful. Demi-humans already get a lot of front-loaded abilities, which we're going to see when we go into races. So that's, that's the short answer. So let's scroll down a little bit and let's look at areas of advancement. Now you might note, first of all, your question might be, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, Bill. So clerics don't have any, uh, so elves don't have any gods? nor dwarves, nor halflings, etc., and so on. Um, these are player classes. In the next table we're going to look at over on page 14, we're going to see that there are non-player classes available for demi-humans. And you might think, well, why does that matter? Because if your demi-human character or if your party encounters a village of gnomes or a village of of uh, of elves or what have you they might have these classes with them they just don't adventure so let's look at table two this is class level limitations and again this gets a little sticky with some people they don't think it's fair that their elf, who already is at plus one to hit with bow and sword, has infravision, gets, you know, potentially a dozen extra languages. In leather armor, uh, is virtually impossible to surprise. Um, Let's see, what else do they get? Oh, they'll live for thousands of years and so on. They think it's unfair that they're not allowed to, to, uh, to advance. I happen to, as you might guess, hold a different point of view. So let's go down. NPC dwarves, maybe clerics. Um, up to 8th level. Dwarven fighters may advance to ninth level as long as they have a strength of 17. Uh, if they have a strength of less than 17, they're limited to 7th level. Um, I'm sorry, those with strength 17 are limited to 8th level, and 18 strength allows dwarves to advance to 9th level as fighter. Unlimited and thief. Now, across the board, I'm just going to save you, with the exception of the half-orc, every race can level unlimited in thief it's the one job everybody can do really well and they can be assassins to the ninth level elven non-player clerics uh can advance to seventh level as fighter they may advance to the seventh level and it notes if they have less than 17 strength they are limited to fifth level those with 17 strength are limited to sixth so 7th is just for 18. Magic user. Now that's a purview for an elf. Uh, they may rise to 11th level. And again, we have a footnote there. Elven magic users with intelligence of less than 17 are limited to 9th level. Those with intelligence of 17 are limited to 10th. So you have to have an intelligence of 18 to hit the 11th level as a magic user. Again, Thief is unlimited, Assassin, 10th level. Gnomish Clerics, non-player, 7th level. Uh, fighter, 6. If they have a less than 18 strength, they're limited to 5th. Illusion is 7. Now, this is interesting. Gnome Illusionists with intelligence or dexterity under 17 are limited to 5th level. Those with both intelligence and dexterity of 17 are limited to 6th. So to hit 7th level illusionist as a gnome, you must have an intelligence of 18, but also a dexterity of 18. 
I think that's probably why the gnome illusionist thief is probably such a, a powerful and popular uh, combo. But we'll get to multi-classing later. Uh, unlimited is thief. Assassin is seventh. A gnomish assassin. I'm thinking of the little uh, the, the the little thing that was trying to kill the the little girl in the Stephen King cat's eye. You know, the little and he had the knife and the cat knocked him into the fan. Um, half elves may druid up to level five. I'm sorry, they may cleric up to level five. They are unlimited as druids. Um, eighth level fighters with the uh, less than 17 is six uh, level. 17 is limited to seventh, so you would need an 18 strength to to uh, advance to eighth. They may be rangers with similar strictures. Um, let me see. Magic users with the same strictures as elves, they can go up to 8th. Oh, and they can also ranger up to 8th. Unlimited in Thief. 11th is Assassin. Um, there are no halfling clerics. I would argue against that, but uh, there, are, there are no halfling clerics, either PC nor NPC. But at the same time, if you think about The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings... Elves were very practical folk. Magic is kind of a strange thing out on the fringe to them. I can see I can see halflings favoring a poultice or a sling or, or even a leech or some some herb work uh, as being eminently more practical than going to a church and praying over things. I mean, you know, uh, as as strong a Catholic and Christian as as uh, Tolkien wasn't odd saying that a Catholic and a Christian, they're the same. Um, you know, there were no churches in Hobbiton, nor even in Bree. So, just food for thought there. They can NPC Druid up to 6th level. That may be a little bit more along the lines of what a Halfling Cleric would be. So an NPC Halfling Druid can attain 6th level. Uh, fighter up to six level with similar strictures as uh, uh, oh no 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 wait I'm sorry I was uh, getting ahead of myself so we'll go into this when we dip back into which races you know cover which uh, you know which abilities but halflings of hair feet subrace, as well as other types of subraces with strength under 17, are limited to fourth. Tall fellows of 17 strength and stouts of 18 strength can work up to fifth level. Tall fellows that somehow obtain an 18 strength can work up to sixth level. So think about the uh, the different families of halfling in the Lord of the Rings, and that's what Gary is addressing there. Um, they can become an 11th. Uh, I'm sorry, not, they cannot be assassins, but they can be thieves. Although they prefer expert treasure hunter. Half orcs can advance up to fourth level in clericdom. Tenth level is fighter. Eighth level is thief. Although if they have a dexterity of less than 17, they're limited to 6th level. And those with a dexterity of 17 are limited to 7th. So they have to have a dexterity of 8th to advance to uh, Thief 8th level. And they can unlimited as Assassin. And humans can be anything. So, let's take a look at their raison date for each race. Um, there are ability score minimums and maximums. Character race table three. So remember when we were talking about halflings with uh, strength, you know, uh, maximum uh, for attaining the highest possible level of fighter. It said, if by some means, because if we look over in the halfling column, and we are now on page 15, by the way. I apologize for just skipping over that. Um, 
you know, all halflings across the board just max out at 17. <laughs> so you're never going to have that 18 double lot halfling who's lifting uh, boulders and uh, and and uh, tearing open Port Kali uh, unless he gets gauntlets of ogre power. Um, so there's minimums and maximums across this entire table. I'll touch on a few of the interesting ones like the halflings there. Uh, dwarves can have a con potentially have a constitution as high as 19. Now you might ask me, Bill, what does a constitution of 19 uh, get you? The book stops at 18 for its stats. Now that kind of caught me up for a while, but fortunately, Jim Ward's Deities and Demigods covers superlative stats. So if you do find yourself with a character with a stat above 18, you can consult that volume. Um, let's see. Uh, wisdom maximum of 18 for dwarves. They can be very wise. Um, let's see. A 17 maximum uh, for female dwarves for strength. Um... Charisma maximum of 16. I think Thorin was a fairly charismatic dwarf, don't you? Uh, looking over at elves, 18 and 16. Now, one thing I want to tell you is the rules are yours and your dungeon masters to use. So when I state these male and female differences in strength, I'm not promoting any specific point of view. I am reading the material in the book. Um... So, so don't think that I'm pushing any one particular point of view. Your dungeon master might come in and say, that's bunk, everybody has a possibility to have a seven, uh, an 18 strength, or what have you. Or they may hew the line specifically to this. But don't judge them if they do. If they say, this is how the rules are written, and I'm playing the game by the rules is written, even though I don't agree with them, I mean... You know, if two chess players agree that the queen should only be able to move one and the king should be able to move where he wants, and they're enjoying their chess game that way, they're enjoying their chess game that way. They may not agree with a given set of rules in chess. But if if that's the way they wish to play it, that's the way they wish to play it. So don't think I'm pushing any particular agenda when when I note that there are strength differences like n female gnomes can only be a 15 strength males can be an 18 now if you guys remember that huge gnome coffee table book uh that you know had gnomes doing gnomish things and so on and etc i wouldn't think the females would be any less strong than the male gnome but there we go um so yes dwarves can have a constitution of 19 elves can have a dexterity as high as 19 um, let's see. Everyone else seems to have the same minimums and maximums, except halflings can have a constitution up to 19 also. It's that hobbit resistance, you know? It's what gave Frodo and Sam the ability to crawl up the side of that mountain, uh, and get ready to throw the ring and all the, you know... <laughs> Poor Frodo had to have his finger bitten off by Gollum. Um, but yes, that 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 uh, physical resolve that hobbits are known for, I think, is reflected there in the halfling uh, having a, a constitution of 19. And then um, half-orcs may also have a constitution of 19, but a charisma maximum of 12. Now, humans aren't listed on this because humans can have a maximum of 18 in everything. So let's see. Before we dive into race descriptions, um, two things. I'm not going to linger too much on race descriptions. You guys know what a dwarf is. You guys know what a halfling is. You know what an elf is and indeed even a half-elf is. Um, we'll talk a little bit about half-orcs. Just a little bit. Um, 
but I want to focus more on what each one brings and it's going to hopefully in your minds reinforce the level limit consideration. Okay. Hopefully you'll kind of get why there are level limits in AD&D. But before we dive in there, I want to see any questions. Uh, Katie says, wow, so there is a lot of multi-classing in AD&D. Yes, there is, Katie. You can build very interesting characters. And I hate to say the word build. Ah, shame on me. Create. You can create a great many interesting characters in AD&D through the multi-classing system. I mean, if you've got someone who just, they've got their heart set on running that that um, uh, paladin, but they want to be an elf, tell them to run a fighter cleric. Because guess what? You can multi-class as a fighter cleric. Can't play a straight cleric, but you can multi-class as a fighter cleric. Um, you know, it, it just... Th there are lots of options via multi-classing. Oh my, I have no viewers on YouTube now. I'm sorry if I lost you guys. All right. So let's move on. Let's look at some of the advantages of playing a dwarf. Um, so dwarfs have exceptional constitutional strength. Um, oh, no, I'm getting ahead. So over on page 15. Because of their very nature, dwarves are non-magical and do not ever use magical spells. However, this nature gives them a bonus regarding their saving throws. See combat, comma, saving throws against magic attacks by wands, staffs, rods, and spells. This bonus is plus one for every three and a half points of constitution ability. Thus, if a dwarf had a constitution of seven, he would gain plus two on die rolls uh, made as saving throws. Or uh, at a 14 constitution, the bonus would be plus four. And at an 18, the constitution bonus would be the maximum normally possible plus five. Being a dwarf, even if you're limited to ninth level fighter or unlimited, unlimited level thief, ain't so bad now, is it? Now, I spoke about languages earlier. Uh, oh, no, I'm get, once again getting ahead of myself. Similarly, dwarves have exceptional constitutional strength with regard to toxic substances ingested or injected. Therefore, all dwarven characters make saving throws against poison in the same manner and with the same bonuses as they do against magical attacks from wands, staves, rods, and spells. So if you've got a dwarf with an 18 con in addition to all the bonuses that brings, you're saving versus magical attacks at plus 5 right off the boat, and you're saving versus poison at plus 5. Tell me it's not fair that dwarves can't go past night level fighter. Furthermore, uh, all dwarves are able to speak the following languages. Dwarven, gnome, goblin, kobold, and orcish. In addition, dwarven characters are able to speak the common tongue of all humankind. However, except for their alignment language, they are unable to learn more than two additional languages, regardless of their intelligence ability. So, you get a dwarf fighter, you get a 14, you stick it in intelligence... That's plus three languages. Well, plus two in his case. So that's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's six languages you get as a dwarf. Now, this is even... Uh, dwar dwarves get better, guys. Dwarves are, are, are even better. Dwarves are able to see uh, in the radiation and inf infrared spectrum, so they can see up to 60 feet in the dark, noting varying degrees of heat radiation. This ability is known as infravision. 60 feet of infravision. They don't need torches. They don't need torches, plus five to nearly all saves, uh, additional languages, 
and in the words of the late great Billy Mays, but wait, there's more. Let's go over to page 16. Well, we'll start on the top of page 15. Dwarves are miners of great skill. They are able to detect the following facts when within 10 feet or less of the particular phenomena, except for determination of approximate depth, which can be done at any distance. Detect slope or... Uh, D yeah. detect grade or slope in passage upward or downward 75 percent probability detect new construction or passage or tunnel 75 percent probable did monsters just dig this is this an ancient lava tube three and four times they'll know detect sliding or shifting walls or rooms now that's above any detect trap skill they've got that's a 1 in 4 on a D6. 66 and 2 -third percent probability for those of you who want to do the math. Detect traps involving pits, falling blocks, and other stonework. 50% chance. Okay? A dwarf thief or fighter thief out of the box naturally has a better skill at detecting those traps than he does through his Thieves Guild training. So think about that. Determine approximate depth underground, 50% probability. Oh, and those probabilities are determined determined uh, on a D6 uh, or a D4, a 1 to 2 or a 1 to 3. Um, although the approximate depth underground is just given as 50%, but I would think you could use it either way. You could use a, you know, use a D6 or a D4 or actual D percentile days. And it does note that uh, dwarven characters must be actively seeking to determine the phenomena in question in order to be able to determine the answer. The information does not simply spring to mind unbidden. So it's not like you've just got this radar that's on all the time that says, boop, wall over there, boop, secret door over there. Uh, as has already been noted, dwarven characters get a bonus of plus one added to their initial constitution ability and a penalty of one on their charisma due to racial characteristics. It is very important to note that the actual charisma score prior to racial adjustment, however, for dwarven characters do not suffer charisma penalties, nor are they limited to 16 charisma maximum with regard to their own race. So, you know, hey, to me, that that, that lady over there with the beard, lo the lovely braided... Uh, uh, mutton chops, quite a, quite attractive. <laughs> um, and then it just kind of goes on to to explain this. Uh, so if you have an eighteen, if you roll an eighteen on your dwarven charisma, you would put it as sixteen with eighteen in parens next to it. Now elves, you would think that the the column for elves would be just just. Uh, uh, chock full of information, and and there there is uh, a good uh, a good bit of info in there. So let's see. Any questions? Any comments? YouTube is gaslighting again. Yeah, no real time viewer number for Bill. Yeah, that's that's basically it. It looks like there's nobody there. So yay YouTube, yay! Such an elegant. Uh, uh, application. Okay, so let's talk about elves. Let's talk about those leafeared tree hoppers, shall we? Um, there are many sorts of elves, and description of the differing types are found in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Monster Manual. Elven players are always considered to be high elves, the most common sort of elf. And we'll kind of get into that later. A character of elven stock can opt to be a fighter, maximum of 7th level. Oh, we, we've already been through that. Katie, you asked about multiclassing. Here we go. This is on page 16. Um, Left-hand column, sort of towards the bottom. It's the fourth paragraph from the bottom. An elven character can also multi-class 
i.e. a fighter magic user, a fighter thief, a magic user thief, or a fighter magic user thief. If a character is multi-class, the following restrictions and strictures apply. Although able to operate freely with the benefits of armor, weapons, and magical items available to the classes the character is operating in, any thieving is restricted to the armor and weapon reusable by the thief class. All earned experience is always divided equally among the classes of the character, even though the character is no longer able to gain levels in one or more of the classes. More detailed information is given in the character classes section hereafter. All right, and we get on with more superpowers for demi-humans that us poor humans, you know, fuck yeah, humanity, uh, don't get. So elven characters are 90% resistant to sleep and charm. Um, and so uh, if these spells are cast upon them, a percentile die, die roll of 91% or better is required to allow the magic any chance of having an effect. And even then, the saving throw versus spells is allowed. So your elves come in loaded for bear when it comes to brushing off sleep and charm. Now, this is something, again, this is me saying demi-human level limits are, are, are not a bad thing. Because listen to what elves get, just out of the box. When employing either a bow of, a, of any sort other than a crossbow, or a short or long sword, elven characters gain a bonus of plus one to hit on their die rolls. Right there, plus one to hit. And now let's address languages a bit. Uh, all elven characters are able to speak the following languages in addition to their own, uh, that of their chosen alignment. Um, Elvish, obviously. Gnome, halfling, goblin, hobgoblin, orcish, knoll, and common. K elven characters above 15 intelligence are able to learn one additional language for every point of intelligence over 15. A character with an intelligence score of 18 could learn three additional languages. Let's scroll back down a little bit. Let's unpack this. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine possible languages. Nine possible languages. And if the thief's playing a thief, that's thief can't. That's tenth. <clears throat> Again, we're not counting alignment or common in that. Nine languages that an elf can know. Uh, elves have 60 feet of infravision. Secret or concealed doors are difficult to hide from elves. Merely passing within 10% of the ladder makes an elven character 1 in 6 likely to notice it. If they're actively searching, they're 2 in 6 likely to find a secret door and 50% likely 3 in 6 uh, to discover a concealed portal. Keen indeed are the eyes of the elves. Elves add a plus one to their initial dexterity score. They do deduct one from constitution, but still, you're not going to be hit that often if you've got a high enough dex. Now, now listen to this. Elves. If alone and not in metal armor, or if well in advance, 90 feet or more, of a party which does not consist entirely of elves and or halflings, an elven character moves so silently that he or she will surprise monsters on a 1 in 4 on d6. Unless some portal must be opened in order to confront the monster. In the latter case, the chance for surprise drops to a uh, 1 in 2. Uh, a 1 or a 2 on a d6. I don't care what you feel about uh, demi-human level limits. That There's no disadvantages to playing an elf. Not in my mind. Or a dwarf. I mean, honestly, it, ba it balances out. So gnomes, um, gnomes are even better at underground work than dwarves. Um, similarly to their cousins, the dwarves, gnomes are highly magic resistant and they gain all the bonuses uh, versus those. Uh, gnome languages. Dwarvish gnome, halfling, goblin, kobold, and they can communicate with any burrowing mammal, such as badgers, ground squirrels, etc. Gnomes are unable to learn more than two languages in addition to those noted above, regardless of how high their intelligence score is. So, 
So gnomes get a big salad bar of languages and they can talk to woodland creatures that dig rabbits, squirrels, badgers, moles, what have you. Picturing a little gnomish cronk. Squeakity, squeakin', squeakin', squeak. All right. So bottom of page 16, right-hand column. Detect slope in passage, upwards or downwards, 80% probability. Detect unsafe walls, ceilings, or floors. Should I put in a cross beam up there? 70% uh, probability. And you can do these on a D10, uh, uh, you know, 1 in 8 for 80 and a 1 in 7 on, uh, on uh, a D10. Uh, approximate depth underground, 60% probability. And determine direction of travel underground, 50%. And again, with dwarves, it must be important to note that the gnome is actively seeking to determine this. In melee combat, gnome characters add plus one to hit uh, opponents who are kobolds or goblins, when be attacked by gnolls, bugbears, ogres, trolls, ogre magi, giants, and or titans, gnome characters subtract four from their opponents to hit die rolls because gnome of gnomes' small size and their combat skill against these much larger creatures. You're not going to get pounded by a giant creature if you've got an insanely high dex as a gnome. Even starting out, you're quite safe. Um, so we, we come to half-elves. And... Um, Gary notes, half-elves do not form a race unto themselves, but rather they can be found amongst both elven kind and men. Um, for details, a half-elf see the monster manual under the heading elf. All right, um, we'll talk about their multi-classing options here. A character of half-elven race can also opt to become a multi-classed individual. A cleric fighter, cleric ranger, now there's a potent sounding stack, huh? Cleric Magic User, Fighter Magic User, Fighter Thief, Magic User Thief, Cleric Fighter Magic User, or a Fighter Magic User Thief. Half-Elven characters who choose the Cleric as one of their multi-classes aren't limited by that class's prescriptions to weapons usable, but they are quite restricted in level. Half-Elven characters who choose the Thief class as one of their multi-roles are limited to the weaponry and armor of that class when operating as a Thief. All earned experience is divided equally above the classes of the multi-class character, even though there is no the character is no longer able to gain levels in one or more of the classes. Uh, and similarly to elves, but less potent, um, they are thirty percent resistant to sleep and charm. They have 60% of infravision. Their languages are Elvish, of course. Uh, so common, but an alignment, but Elvish, Gnome, Halfling, Goblin, Hobgoblin, Orcish, and Knoll. And in intelligence above 16, they're able to learn one additional language for every point of intelligence. So 17 indicates one additional language and 18, two languages. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, potentially eight, nine languages. Secret or concealed doors are difficult to hide from half-elves just as they are noticeable by elves. Merely passing within 10 feet of a concealed door gives the half-elven character a one in six chance of spotting it. If the character is actively searching, it's a two in six chance and uh, a three in six chance of locating a concealed door just as elves. So as you can see, guys, as, as we're getting across here, and once we get through the races, we're going to pause and I'll answer any questions. Um, Demi-humans are pretty all right. I mean, yeah, you come front-loaded, but your multi-classing abilities are just for you and your ability to... Um, you know, all the various abilities, I think, more than make up for hitting a level cap. 
Halflings are very much like small humans, thus their name. As player characters, it is assumed that any of the subraces of the race of halfling can be considered as that of the halfling character in question. And then, once again, sends us over to the monster manual. A character of the halfling race can be a fighter, a thief, or a fighter, thief. Uh, as halflings are unable to work beyond six levels fighters, it is most probable that the character will be a thief or multi-class fighter thief. In the latter case, the character is limited to the armor and weaponry of a thief whenever any such functions are to be performed during the course of an adventure. Can you really picture a halfling wearing, like, full plate? I can't, but maybe I'm just not that imaginative a guy. Um, I mean, you know, Bilbo went out in a waistcoat and and not even a pocket handkerchief. And then he got Sting. And until the dwarves made him look ridiculous by plying him with, with armor, he wore none. And for that matter, I don't think the dwarves did either. Um... You know, Bilbo had his ring of invisibility, his thief abilities, and his uh, plus one sword with enemy detection abilities. The end. And he did just fine. Although he did keep the male shirt and gave that to Frodo, but I digress. A character of the half... Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> All halfling characters have a high resistance to magic spells, so for every three and a half points of constitution, he or she gains a plus one on saving throws versus wands, staffs, rods, and spells. Okay, so you... Uh, same as dwarves. So at an 18 constitution, possibly even a 19 constitution, if you're high enough, um, a high enough con, you gain up to a plus five. Uh, as halflings also have a similar resistance to poison, it's the same as dwarves, plus one to plus five. They speak the following languages, dwarven, elven, gnome, goblin, halfling, and orcish, uh, and one additional language above, uh, at or above 16. So, again, you're getting one, two, three, four, five, potentially eight if you've got thieves, can't nine. Alignment tongue in common, ten, eleven. Um, what was it uh, in the Lord of the Rings? Speak no, speak no secrets here. He's a master of our tongue, in reference to Frodo. Um, they have infravision, thirty feet of infravision. Uh, those of pure stoutish blood are able to uh, see up to sixty feet of normal infravision. Uh, halflings of mixed type and those of stoutish blood are able to note if a passage is up or down uh, 75% of the time, a 1 to 3 on a d4, and they can determine direction 50% of the time. And of course, like gnomes and dwarves, only if they're concentrating on it. They have the same surprise capability as elves do. They're at minus 1 strength, but they gain plus 1 on dex. Halflings are pretty awesome, too. Let us continue. This is the word that tripped me up as a kid. Orcs are fecund and create many crossbreeds. That just means they have lots of kids. Fecund, that is. Most of the offspring as such being typically orcish. However, some one-tenth of orc-human uh, mongrels are sufficiently non-orcish to pass as human. Complete details of orcs and crossbreeds will be found in Monster Manual again. Um, they can multi-class. Cleric fighter, cleric thief, cleric assassin, fighter thief, or fighter assassin. I've always thought the notion of an orc cleric fighter, a lawful good orc cleric fighter, he really wanted to be a paladin. It's kind of silly and romantic, but you know... Uh, like the, the orc noble in um, the game Oblivion, you know, walk around talk, speaking nobly, speaking in malpropisms. I would be grateful if you would exterminize them for me. Um, and yes, the, the XP is divided across class, even if you can't advance anymore. Uh, in a given class. They can speak common, their alignment as well. 
um, and Orcish. They can learn two additional languages. So, uh, Orcish and two languages. So that's three alignment. Possibly thieves can't possibly as many as six languages. Um, they have infravision. They get plus one to strength and constitution, but must subtract a pe charisma penalty of minus two. So you could have an orc out of the box who could have a con and a strength of 19. Scary to think about. Now here's the little bit that Gary gives us under humans. Human characters are given either penalties or a bonus as they are established as the norm upon which these subtractions or additions for racial stock are based. Human characters are not limited as to what character uh, class they can become or what character they can become, nor do they have any maximum limit other than intrinsic to the class of level they can attain within a class. As a rule, they, as they are the rule rather than the exception, basic information given for them always applies to humans and racial changes are noted for different races as applicable to non-human or part-human stocks. And that's where we're going to bring this in for a landing today. So our, our exemplar character, we didn't do a lot of rolling and picking today. Our exemplar character, we're going to go with human. If I can learn how to spell. So there's our exemplar character who is human. But I think maybe now you can see with all of the benefits given to demi-humans just exactly how well balanced it is, to be honest with you. Um, you know, you might have a, a, a half-orc Let's let's go back to the half orc paladin for lack of a better terms. Fourth level fighter, tenth level cleric, and you're able to bend bars and lift gates like an ogre or a titan even. Well, no, I think nineteen strength is hill giant, possibly uh possibly even better, but it's not Titan. And you're just you're getting so many extra hit points. It's it's from from the get go, it's ridiculous. So who cares if you max out as an eighth level fighter? You start out potentially better than any human could be. And with elves, you know, it's it's kind of the same deal with elves. You're at plus one a hit with bow and sword. Your your um. You, you know, you've got infravision. You've got massive magical resistances. Um, and, and your multi-classing ability, you know, fighter, magic user, thief, fighter, cleric, magic user. Those are all amazing options that humans just don't get. Now, yes, a human can dual class, but we'll talk about dual classing in the next lesson. But hopefully you're seeing that demi-human level limits really do balance out in that out-of-the-box, demi-humans are able to do so much more than your bog-standard human. Humans come to the forefront in a longish run. But think about this. If you're playing a high elf character and you start the game at age 850, barring misadventure, you're going to live for millennia longer than your friend Bob the Fighter over here. I mean, level limits, who cares about them? You know, the, the, the lives of your friends are over in a brief spring. And if, by chance, you've, bef you've befriended a half-orc in less than a season, I think half orcs like live to be like fifty five or something like that. It's it's not pretty. So take that take take that to heart when you're considering advanced Dungeons and Dragons. The demi human level limits are not necessarily a bad thing, because if you work within the class and you pick your multi classes, you can do pretty much anything a human can do 
or at least mimic it well enough to play that half-orc paladin or that elven paladin or, you know, an elven paladin who can also cast magic user spells if you want. You know, fighter, magic user, cleric, elf. Um, now, I'm not going to get into house rules. And if you're out there and say, well, I'm going to house rule it so that demi-humans can advance as high as anyone and play, that's, that's up to you. We're just learning how to play Dungeons and Dragons, and I wanted to drive home the importance, the why, of demi-human level limits, and I hope it's come across in this lesson today. So I'm going to take a few questions. Uh, nothing over on, over on YouTube. So any questions, anyone on YouTube, or if you're watching on Facebook, any questions at all? Oh, and by the way, you might have noticed that I didn't mention bards. We'll get to bards. Don't worry. We'll get to we'll, we'll get to bards. So, any questions? Anyone? Anyone at all? Otherwise, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up. I'll give you guys a few minutes. If anyone's got any questions, and uh, I have a question for you guys: Are you playing along at home? Are you making up a character as we go? I'd like to know about it. Or are you just kind of absorbing all this, sort of taking all this in? Just let me know. I wonder if um, YouTube was, was like hiding and lying to me, gaslighting me, uh, as Paul uh, Bacleta said, um, because uh, I kept saying race over and over again. God, how would you have a how would you have a YouTube channel that talked about Formula One? He's number one this automobile contest season. He's the best automotive driver in the sport. <laughs> so any questions, anyone at all? Any questions as we wrap for today? Tomorrow is Wasteful Wednesday. I believe Kyle will be back. I'll have to double check with him. Um, but unless he wants to do, unless he's going to be back and wants to do uh, an action scene in conflict, um, we'll, uh, we'll um, continue on with the lessons and maybe get some input from Kyle. Since since we've already generated our character, ha 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 ha. <laughs> we'll talk to Kyle about uh, picking class and taking names. Uh, but also, since we've chosen human, we're going to look at classes. Now I've already decided on fighter, but we're going to take a look at first edition AD and D classes. There's no artificer. There's no tinker gnome. Is a sorcerer and wild mage and so on. But I think you'll find that the simplicity of just having all those ingredients at hand, I think you're going to find that the AD&D character uh, class, sorry, got a little happy with the scrolling again, um, that the, uh, the classes presented in AD&D can scratch a number of itches. So... So, it looks like there's no questions today. Um, I, again, I hope you're following along and generating a character of your own. Um, you guys have an absolutely wonderful day. Uh, I'm going to go have some lunch. Uh, I appreciate you all being here, guys. I really do. Thank you for watching the video. Um, I will, again, be back tomorrow evening, uh, Thursday. Jeff Telanian guesting on the show, so we get a break. We'll have a special guest in class. Um, but yeah, Jeff Telanian will be here on Thursday. Hope to hear from uh, Alan Grohe and we can get some good uh, we can get some good Greyhawk talk going. But if not this week, then next week. But also next week, uh, Matt Finch. Don't have the day nailed down yet, but Matt Finch will be here next week. Um, still chasing Ty Beard around, trying to get Ty's... Uh, uh, 
uh, tie to grace the show. Um, so yeah, yeah, you guys take care and I will see you all tomorrow. Peace. Love you. Bye.